Vibrations Podcast, Part 20, Joe Farrell. Hi, I'm Gary Brightman, and this is my weekly podcast called Vibrations. Established in 2018, Vibe is a book and music shop situated in Moi Wo on Lantau Island in Hong Kong. So, what's been happening over the past week? The Flower Boat Girl by local author Larry Fane, a novel about the 19th century Lantau pirates, is now available at the shop. For those that had pre-ordered, please come and pick up. All copies are nicely signed, and I've started reading this well-written novel prior to its world premiere at Vibe on Saturday the 3rd of April at 2pm. The books are selling well, and there are only a few spaces left for the premiere if you're interested to attend. Catherine Cormack and Joe Lodder are currently doing their hike for freedom to stop human and animal abuse. Hiking the main trails of Hong Kong, covering a distance of 300 kilometres and an elevation of 18,600 metres. We wish them great strength to achieve this challenge and a safe and triumphant return to Lantau. Remember, it's all about raising charity funds, so please give anything you can spare at give.asia slash campaign slash hike dash for dash freedom hash and i'll put that at the end of this podcast the snake ghetto fabulous a field guide to the snakes of hong kong by adam francis made it across the water to vibe in moi wo on thursday and made a very big splash our fastest selling book in three years was sold out within three hours proving the value of subscribing to our facebook feed at Vibe Silvermine Bay. With over 40 types of snake in Hong Kong, nine of them venomous, it's well worth getting to know your king cobras from your wolf snakes. I will pick up further copies tomorrow, but the thousand book first print run has been devoured by the Hong Kong public at large and Adam is working on a second print run. My new project, Vibe Reboot version 2.0, is underway This new evolution of the shop will consist of downsizing on books and DVDs, of which we have over 24,000, and bringing in new lines of products. Essentially, we'll always remain a book and music shop though. To help me achieve this, I'm giving away books and DVDs every day. I'm also limiting the donations we accept to those only agreed with myself. We will take the right sorts of book, CD, vinyl, hi-fi equipment, puzzles, and games going forward. But please contact me in the first instance on WhatsApp at 9574-5820 or email me at vibehk at icloud.com. Many thanks for your continued support. We hope to get back on track with events in April with some low-key book talks and tiny desk gigs, COVID restrictions permitting. As already mentioned, we have Larry Fane presenting on the 3rd of April at 2pm. We have local photographer Patrick Dransfield presenting the following week on the 10th of April, again at 2pm. I'll also be interviewing Patrick for my next podcast. Both events will go out on Facebook Live as well as being added to our YouTube channel at Live at Vibe HK. Moi Wo's Martin Molden has a new Lantau serving website called Lantau Network. And guess who's on there? Its purpose is to give local businesses and craftspeople a place to advertise their wares and also events happening on the island. We'll be interviewing Martin soon for this podcast, but in the meantime, you can find out more at lantownetwork.com. The best ideas are often the simplest, aren't they? And so to this week's interview. Joe Farrell is an award-winning black and white photographer and cultural anthropologist. Born in London in England, she has been based in Hong Kong for the past 12 years. Her photography work focuses on the traditions and cultures that are dying out, including the project Living History, Bound Feet Women of China. Joe uses black and white film and shoots on a Hasselblad camera. She has been the recipient of numerous awards for her work on Bound Feet, including Jacob Rees Award, Black and White Spider Award, Centre for Fine Art Photography and Women in Photography International winner, juried by Mary Ellen Mark. 
She's had solar exhibitions in London, San Francisco and Hong Kong and has been included in group shows in New York, LA and Denver. Her project has received critical acclaim and has been published internationally, including the Smithsonian Magazine, Huffington Post, Wall Street Journal, BBC, CNN, The Guardian, Stern Magazine, Time Out, Fast Company, International Business Times and the Sydney Morning Herald. She's spoken at TEDx Wan Chai and TEDx in Warwick and an In Conversation events hosted by the Women's Foundation Hong Kong in May 2015 and at the Asia House in London in June 2015. She has held talks at Pitt Rivers Museum, Oxford, Bart's Pathology Museum in London and the VNA, Reiko San Francisco, Blue Lotus Gallery in Hong Kong and numerous organisations such as the AWA, Friends of CUHK Museum and Rotary Club. Jo has also done live television interviews at RTHK, The Works, CNN and the BBC News Insight programme and has been a guest speaker on Monocol Radio and RTHK3. So, welcome to Vibe, Jo. It's nice to be here, Gary, on this such a beautiful day. As we do, we'll start off uh, with our ten questions. What's your favourite book or author? There's been a couple of books in my life that have really motivated me or inspired me. One of them is Wild Swans. OK, uh, yeah. Which, of course, is... Chung Chung is a wonderful woman. But I think when I read that originally, it opened my eyes to what China is like or was like and it really uh, got my inspiration going right. um one of my other favorite books is the private life of chairman mao it was yeah. written by mao's physician throughout his life and it starts right. off when mao has died and the physician is trying to work out how much formaldehyde to yeah. actually put in yeah. his body and he has to travel to russia to see what they did there and it's so it's fascinating next question favorite musical artist something that really gets me up and going is nina simone oh yeah yeah definitely. i'm a yeah. huge fan of any of her music i did manage to see her twice in london and also michael nyman um, I've seen him perform live about 10 times. Really? Uh, he, so for those who don't know his work, he wrote the music, the score for things like... Z and Two Z Nords. Z and Two Nords, uh, Draftsman's Contract, Draftsman, yeah. Do It Live. And also he was born yeah. on March the 23rd, which is my birthday. Next question, preferred drink? An Earl Grey gin and tonic. Yeah, gin That's infused tea is really nice. Do you have a life motto? My motto is to look both ways. Yes. Because yes. as a photographer, I always say that if I walk down a street and photograph, mm. I want to walk back the same street from the opposite direction because you see other things. Mm. In life, it's important to see other people's perspective before judging favorite hong kong walk my studio is in chai Wan and i like to hike up by the cemetery during covid i've been doing it most days although it's been a bit more tricky now that i've got a yeah. new dog favorite hong kong oh, restaurant God, again <laughs> i suppose i look at it as where i take people when yeah. they come to visit hong kong um i always go to the peak lookout for the last 25, 30 years when it used to be the Peak Cafe. Yeah, me too, actually. Yeah. And it, it is one of my all-time favourites. I love their soft-shell crab. Yes. So yeah. I'll always order the soft-shell crab, a Caesar salad, um, rosé or chardonnay. So, oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Quite often do the peak, the walk around the peak. Yeah, and yes. End up there. And Stanley, the, the boat house, which yes. I'm sure used to be called the Blue House. The, the third place I would always take people to is The a third of your favourites, yes. Joe. <laughs> well, I have too many. Yeah, no, uh, go on. Diaper dongs. I feel for all of them now that, you know, uh, they yeah, have to close at night. It's such a hard time. Faced with a python whilst walking up to the peak, what would you do? I would 
photograph it. I would definitely stop and photograph it. I would probably put myself in some danger by getting the right angles yes, and yes. trying to get maybe close-up details of its skin, yes. uh, the scales, the eyes. Best advice you were given? I had an exhibition in London at the Hatton Gallery about 14 years ago and I exhibited my work from China and from Tibet and from Cuba and my beginning of my bare feet work and I had a friend of mine who I've known 20, 30 years, Zelda, she is a photography professional, she used to work for the Photographers Gallery in London as the print buyer and I said to her can you give me some constructive criticism can you tell me what I should do and she said to be honest what you need to do and what you're not doing is that you need to focus that your work is too general you have to focus on a on a subject and become the master of it finish this sentence i live in hong kong because part of the reason i live in hong kong is and this was actually talked about in one of your previous podcasts was uh, that the how safe it is having lived in london and in san francisco um hong kong is one of the safest places i've ever lived in the world uh, what is your favorite area of hong kong Oh. I'm sorry, I put you through the ring. I know, I it's favourite area. I, I really couldn't say. I I, it's, I I obviously love Chai Wan. I love Shen Wan, actually. If I could live there, I think it's a really nice cafe environment um, with art galleries and stuff. I mean, maybe not so much now but because of the price rises and stuff. But it's a, a very... Yeah. Creative like, area, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. What made you come to Hong Kong in the first place? Originally, I came to Hong Kong because my dad is an architect, and he had won a he had an architectural pra- he still has an architectural practice in London, and the they won the competition to design the Peak Tower. <laughs> wow! They opened an office here overnight. They had to like yep. open an office here to do it. From that, they won the competition to design Kowloon Station. So right. I came over here in 1998 again, second time in 1998, when Kowloon Station was coming to completion to do a book on Kowloon Station. I loved it so much. I, I remember, so I had to go through a lot of the research, the Peak Tower. The Just to remind people, the Peak Tower is actually the shape that we all see as we come up to the tram, that beautiful... Yes. Half Moon Crescent, yes. yes. Yeah, it's, uh, and so when I originally first came here, I yeah. went to the other Peak Tower, yeah. the, the previous one. I think there's been three... At least three, I would say. Yeah, yeah. and I went to... I actually really loved the design of the yeah. previous one. It was very 50s, and I, there was a restaurant on the, like, the second floor, which is actually yeah. where I met my first cockroach. <laughs> um, I thought you were going to say husband. Yeah, that my first, yes. <laughs> I, like well, it, that, I, I think it's the same, isn't it? <laughs> it's like a, um, I was sitting down in the restaurant and I suddenly felt yeah. something crawling up my leg. Oh, that's a horrible feeling, yes, isn't it? Yes, and that was how I met my first cockroach. Yeah. That sounds like the title of a book. Yeah, it could be, couldn't it? Yes. Actually, it really could be. The third time I came back, I was like, this is for good. That if I have no work, then I will work out how to get a work visa. Yeah. work 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 and that that is what I did I was like no this time is for good yeah and so now it's been 14 years 14 years brilliant so you like I think a lot of people that first came here you kind of get bitten by the bug don't you completely you just, yeah you're a photographer yeah how did you get to be a photographer what sort of kicked that interest up well, it's interesting. I was surrounded by photographers where I lived in London. Two of my uh, flatmates were photographers, but they were very different kind of photographers. One of them did catalogue model photography. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Uh, clothes, obviously, yeah. not. Yeah, <laughs> or semi-clothes <laughs> or, or underwear. Or... Or, yeah. <laughs> and uh, another one was editorial and, and fashion photography. 
and I always loved photography. I always had photography magazines. I was always inspired by black and white movies in the 1950s yeah. and 60s that I just loved how they used light and shade. Film and noirs, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. Ju- it was just how they tell, told stories with black and white. Was yeah, just amazed those old Hitchcock me. films. Oh, and, oh, completely. Yeah. And what completely turned everything around was in 1998 when I was in Hong Kong. I went to Beijing for the Easter on yeah. a wing-on tour because that was the cheapest thing you could do. Really? <laughs> it was all all in Chinese. They they thought I was really? mad, but it was. Uh, yeah. I would go along on the. I joined quite a few wing-on tours, and you just go along and leave them. Yeah. Well, because the first day, what happened was we went to Mao Zedong's Rosalie, and, yes. and you had to basically run past him it was this whole rushing Mm. around and I was like I'm trying to photograph I went so I got up at 5 a.m and I went to Emmon Park and saw them carrying the bird cages and doing tai chi and uh, fan dancing and I was just memorized and I kept yeah. going, and I'd get up early and go to the hutongs before they were all pulled down. Yeah, and, and, they were and I just thought, if I could be doing this for the rest of my yeah. life, then that would make me actually really happy. So yeah. I suddenly realized I had found my passion. And it had been yeah. there all along, but I hadn't realized. Because it is like that. I think for, for any Westerner going to Beijing, you know, you oh. just, you're seeing things that you just have no reference to really as you say the Completely. hutongs the parks the 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 right retired people in parks oh doing the dancing mm. and the and the exercising and things but it's, it's culturally and traditionally it's it's i find it you know it's difficult in in hong kong and even in china that they want to leave that all behind that i was thinking about this the other mm. day i saw this little old man with a Mao hat and a Mao jacket. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, fantastic. Because I, I have always loved that kind of more traditional clothes. Yeah. And yet, you know, I know about they want to be more modern and cool and in the mood for love. Yes. I mean, I can watch that over and over again. Me too. The yeah. costumes, the music. I actually do yeah. own the, the soundtrack Me too. to it. So really, the, your photography was awakened by China, really, in Beijing. And, and yeah. just, you'd had that experience, obviously, in London, and that sort of put the idea in your mind. But then that really I used to work for publishers in London, and yeah. I would have to commission photographers. Yeah. And this was a day and age where we had slides and transparencies, and yeah. I would have to catalogue yeah. them. When I was leaving London in 1994, I think it was, um, whether to turn the whole slide library, digitise it. Yeah. My first sort of introduction to you, I, I guess, was your book, your yes. recent book. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so uh, I published a book. I've actually, this is my second book. My, my uh, second book is about women with bound feet. It's called Living History, Bound Feet Women of China. And it is the interview and photographs of 50 different women, mainly from Shandong province, that over the last uh, 16 years that I have interviewed and photographed. And it is kind of trying to show these women because they're not very well documented in China itself. But it was more to get their stories because when I met... The first woman, Zhang Yongying, who's on the cover, I realized that I had a perception of bound feet. And a part of this came from yeah. like um, uh, Wild Swans with Jung yeah. Chung's book that the idea of bound feet just sounded so cruel and yeah. horrible that when I met the first woman, I was completely amazed and that how she had gone through this process and actually created this beautiful object yeah that it was like a sculpture that she had gone through so much to actually achieve this and i just thought it's wrong to say this is a bad thing it's also a judgment that we do things in every society in every culture to make ourselves appear more beautiful and attractive 
um, or to follow traditions of our society. And that's all that that's what they had done. And that's what was considered beautiful. And so it's changed my life. This book is one way of because I'm self funded. So it's one way of actually uh, making some money to continue my projects. At the right. moment, I've been working on uh, women in Myanmar with tattooed faces banned by the Burmese government in the 1960s. So again, these are the okay. last remaining women. And the reasons why they did it was because of their own society and what was considered attractive or marriageable quality. Um, and also the women in Myanmar with the brass coils. Right, um, on the neck. Yeah, Kayan women. The Chin women are with tattoos. Kayan women are with the brass coils. And so I've been documenting them and interviewing them. And last March, I was supposed to be going back there um, to talk to them. And also, um, I had organized going to a tribe which was headhunters and they would tattoo their faces yeah um to in celebration of yeah. some of the heads they had got um That's so alien isn't it and, and so that was but so it's just it's just fascinating yeah. and, and so doing study on gender gender studies about why we alter ourselves you know i yes i was bottle blonde for mm. 25 30 years of my life yeah uh, and it's i have you know i have tattoos and stuff and it's just why why do we do these yes. things and um cosmetic surgery just looking at how we alter ourselves yeah quite incredible i mean as you say with the the women with the bound feet did they have a choice whether they bound their feet or did they feel society was expecting that? It was the societal, but it was also um, about a third of them actually yeah. did it themselves. So they, if their parents, their mother did not want to do it to, to them, um, they would wrap their themselves. feet themselves because they knew if they bound their feet, they could have a better life. Really? That's interesting. So they would be able to marry into more wealth? Yeah, and, <laughs> and the majority of the women that I have interviewed were all farm labourers. They were uh, in rural okay. areas. They were not the elite. They had Very to poor. work. Yeah. So they would marry into a family that had more land, more sheep, okay. more goats. Right, um, right. But it's better than actually, you know, marrying the idiot of the village or, yeah, or not yeah. getting married at all. The girls were commodities. Right. That you, they were there to sell to another family. Um, How sad, you know. really. Yeah. But that's... I think that still happens in so oh, many God. areas. Yeah. And it is sad, but it's kind of like, you know, the, the some of the teenagers of today that, that the cosmetic surgery in western cultures that they go yeah. through because they don't think they're good enough or they want to attract richer men yeah which it's about body image isn't it mm. about how the media portray what is beautiful yeah. this year yeah. and and going back on to so you 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 were you're talking about the the women that had the face tattoos i guess similar to the new zealanders that do as yes. well is that a reason is that a tribal thing or is yeah. that a, yeah okay yeah it's it's completely it's um the story goes that uh, a burmese king a long time ago uh thought that the chin women were very yeah. attractive and took them f for their wives okay. and um to stop the the kings and the elite actually stealing the chin girls they would yeah. tattoo their faces to show where they belonged which tribe ah, they belonged to okay. so in within the chin tribe there's actually 15 different variants of tattoo right okay. some of them are just straight lines yeah. some of them are dots some of them yeah. are more maori yeah um there's one tribe which is it's just completely black wow um but it which showed w that you belong to a group this was your tribe your society that you belong to yeah and that so it was a weird way of saying i'm disfiguring my daughter yeah so that you don't yeah. want her but yeah. we find it beautiful yeah 
And there it's was a little twisted, isn't it? it, it really, but, and then it would be that they believed if you did not have the tattoo markings, yeah, that upon your death you would not be able to cross over the bridge to the next life because ah, so they wouldn't recognize you, okay. So they sort of built that around it as well. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. some people say it's to frighten off tigers. It's, yeah. It's the same rubbish. with the brass calls. It's nothing to do really with tigers. I think yeah. people just like that kind of idea. Yeah, so basically, you know, to for both the women with the bound feet and with the tattoos, they're going through this major life trauma at an age of what you know under 10 seven most seven of them were years old. so the tattoos most of them were done when they were seven years old um the bound feet the majority of them were seven years old it all seems to be around seven and the right. same with the brass coils wow. but the only one with the with the brass coils the the this is being perpetuated by tourism so yeah. i'm not sure what's being happening in the last year with that about four years ago i met a young girl of 18 in myanmar who had had the brass coils put on two years before Crikey. because yeah. her she had been married off at 16 her in-laws had sent her to chiang mai in thailand yeah. where there's a refugee camp for the uh Kayan, yeah. which a lot of people think the Kayan are from thailand because they're in this tourist village where people go and visit and um give money so this 18 year old had just yeah. had it done it's quite late isn't it quite traumatic well I, yes I think, you know, to, to go but through it's that. but it's yeah. this idea of if you come from a rural community how can you make money how can you better yeah. yourself how can you get up yeah you yeah. know, it, it brings up these whole ideas of, mm. you know, how we change yourself. But it's also of if you don't have the education, women have throughout centuries used their bodies yeah. to make money. Yeah. And um, this is just another way. Yeah. It's, it's, see, it just brings up so much. Yeah. So that's but, why I'm studying it. Cause yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Just, it's mind blowing when you start going into it. Yeah. Will you make that into a book? Yes. Yeah. I am working at the moment right. on a master's uh, yeah. research yeah. in gender studies, which I'm hoping to okay. work that more into a book. The final question, how can people tap into Joe Farrell in terms of what you do and, and what do you want people to go away thinking? People have to think about how they judge others. Yes. That it is way too often that we try and put on other cultures our own experience and is it our business uh, yeah. should you know why are we doing this and from how do we know whether we're right i mean a lot of the women's traditions that i document and i see is about yeah. their own society and what they believe and it's not necessarily what we believe. And for us to go around saying that's disgusting and horrible, that it's, you know, the, these women have already yeah. done it. Yeah. It's, who are, who are you to do, judge? Judge, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it goes back to the, the question we asked earlier, isn't it, really? Consider things from your, you know, from both angles, mm. really. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. I've had hate mail. I've yeah. had uh, emails that are just vile. Yeah that have really upset me and so I've said no I'm not reading that anymore it's like you know people yeah, too negative there are haters there will always be haters and so he, he yeah, just for got whatever it. and it's yeah. a lot of them are uneducated okay all right um so how can people get in touch with you Joe, and find out your work obviously my book is available in your shop it is indeed and, yes yes it is um i i have a obviously facebook Joe Farrell Photography, and okay. I have my website, which is more under Living Her Story Photography, which is yeah. a bit, somebody told me the other day, that's a bit long. <laughs> We're like, uh. yeah. Well, it comes from Living History, which I suddenly realise his history. So I changed it to uh, Her story. story. Yeah, very good. Instead of okay. History, Her Story. Her Story. 
Yeah, yeah. actually, that's good. So I, yeah. I was like, hey, yeah. So yeah. I bought that domain and we're yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> off and running. Uh, yeah. yeah, so there, there are mods. Just follow me on Instagram, uh, Facebook. Um, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. around and uh, I try and do like the green fairs to sell my work. Yeah. Um, but in the last year, that's been yeah, pretty tough limited. Going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if people, can still people visit your gallery in Chai Wan? Yes. Um, um, I'm hoping to set up again. We, we've done this previously, is tours of okay. art galleries, art yeah. studios in Chai Wan. Okay. And, you know, once the restrictions are yeah. lifted, I've got mm. a, another Facebook page which I manage, which is called What's yeah. on Chai Wan. And so people can actually visit there if they want yeah. to see what is actually there. We, we've got a lot of things in Chai Wan with yes. art studios and photographers. And we've got next to me is like mm. King Marine Fish where you can buy uh, ah. um, oysters and salmon from Norway and stuff that is okay. open all the time and it, yeah. it mainly sells to the restaurants yes so but I normally go in there and you they, yeah. they'll shuck the oysters for you really? and stuff and there's Italian deli and you yeah know, there's all kinds of things that people don't realize is in Taiwan yeah so get on that MTR or on on the uh, well it's actually I uh, the, the bus uh or the bus. Yeah. yeah the reason why I say the bus because from like central or immigration tax it takes 25 minutes to yeah yeah because you go up that northern corridor yeah, island east island east yeah 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 it's, yeah. it's, it's like just zoom. motorway yeah yeah it's that's what sold me yeah eight years ago when i uh saw the studio and got the bus back to shenwan it took 20 minutes and i was like yeah sold it just remains for me to say thank you very much joe for thank coming you very today. much for having me gary it's been a pleasure you can find out more about joe's work on joe at joefarrell.com you can also view more on our website livinghistory.photography you can listen to all our podcasts published at soundcloud under gauss or on youtube under live at vibe hk or follow the links from my website at vibehk.com this week's shout out to a local lantau business goes to the kitchen the italian cuisine restaurant in moiwo Run by Mark, it's located on the adjacent corner to the China Bear and opposite the Caltex petrol station. You can order takeaway or enjoy the cool, calm, cosy environment from 10am until 11pm daily. They can be found on Facebook under The Kitchen HK or you can phone 5991 6292. The food is excellent and they're well known for their large, tasty, thin cut pizzas. Finally, a reminder that Vibe is open seven days a week, every day of the year, from 12 noon until approximately 6.30pm. Well, that's it for another week. Thanks for listening to the 20th Vibe Book and Music Shop podcast called Vibrations. I'm Gary Brightman. You get my vibe? Can you imagine what this old island must have looked like to those Dutch sailors when they first saw it? Fresh green. A dream of a new world. They must have held their breath. Afraid it would disappear before they could touch it.